Well, it is a joy to be here with you tonight. Let me get the mute cut off. Fire in the hole, how's that? Amen. That's a little better. Hey, I'm uh, pray for my voice. It's not up the snuff tonight. I preached over at the camp meeting uh, Monday night, and so it's not felt good since then. I don't know what happened. I guess I was uh, uh, plowing in some uh, rough ground over there or something. <laughs> But it is a joy to be here with you. And uh, uh, how many was here when I, I came before? Y'all remember me coming last year? Is this a brand new flock, brother? Or they all laid out that Wednesday night? <laughs> well, it's a joy to be here with you. And uh, um, I didn't want to plow over the same ground again. Uh, if, uh, if you had remembered me uh, from uh, last year, I came by and used the parsonage again, and so, or, the, or the missions quarters, and so it was just a blessing to, to be there. And it's uh, good to be uh, here in Wichita again, and uh, y'all need to come over to the meeting over and uh, bring, the, bring everybody over, brother. Tomorrow night especially, we're having buffalo. Ooh. Buffalo to eat. Yeah, that'd be good. And so y'all come over and be with us and, and, uh, and join with us and, and we'll worship together. We've been having a great time over there, a lot of missionaries from all over the United States, uh, native missionaries. And, and so it's just a, a joy for me to be able to go and to visit with them. Most of them I know them, but it's, it's good uh, when I can go and visit with them. And some of them you don't get to see very often and also, uh, I came out just, well, let me back up. Uh, uh, my wife, Cheryl, I do thank you for praying for her. Uh, she was not with me last year. Uh, let's see, uh, it was 2013, she had her cancer and then finished up her chemo in 2014. And then uh, last year, her dad, uh, he was um, uh, dying with cancer and so she was not able to come with me last year. So. We've had all kinds of obstacles uh, in, in our lives, and uh, we're going to have that. that. That is life, and that's what I preached on uh, over at the tent meeting Monday night, how they're in uh, Mark, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, and how the disciples, the Lord told, uh, told his disciples, he said, let's go to the other side. And, uh, and so they set sail, and it weren't long that uh, they were under the command of the Lord, doing exactly what the Lord told them to do, but yet the chaos came. And see, we're going to have that in our lives, but uh, you read farther down in there, and then there was a great calm. Amen. So uh, well, we're all under that command to go and to, and to be missionaries. If you're saved tonight, you're, you're a missionary. You're a missionary to your families, uh, to your neighbors, to your co-workers, uh, your students, you go to school. Uh, those kids you go to school with, that's your mission field. And so we're all, we're all mission, missionaries. And uh, my wife and I are from the Lumbee tribe located in eastern North Carolina. And God has truly blessed our tribe. There's no other tribe in the United States that has, has uh, self-advanced any more than the Lumbee tribe. And uh, we, we've never lived on a reservation uh, it was, I guess, because of our locality, uh, apo- along with God's providence. I see the providence and uh, the hand of God in our tribe. Uh, but uh, we were never on a reservation. And, um, and so we had to sort of carve out, as it were, our own, uh, our own survival there during those early years. And it made us strong. It made us much stronger. And so... Uh, uh, they applied for, thy tribe applied for federal recognition uh, back in the late 1800s, and today we still don't have that. And there again, that's the providence of God in, in my sight, uh, because uh, federal recognition puts you more under bondage, because that's what these reservations that we go to, these people are in bondage. Uh, those reservation uh, boundaries, they're like... Uh, uh, invisible fences that just hold them there, and uh, and so they uh, they live in great poverty there. Worse than all of that, they live in great poverty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I preached uh, on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation last year, and there's over 50 adults, natives, uh, Sioux Indians in, in the church that morning. And I, I told them, I said, I want to share with you some of my uh, native culture. And I started out by saying I was born and raised in a Christian home, and both my parents were saved, and I only knew them that way. I never knew them outside of being saved. And I continued on, and then finally I said, now there's none of you in here that can say that. And they weren't. They weren't. There weren't any of them in there that could say that they had been born and raised in a Christian home. And, and the tragedy, I was looking on the Internet last night, how uh, over on the Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, from uh, December to March, uh, the police department responded to over 103 suicide uh, calls to that reservation. Suicide is the highest uh, rate amongst our native people uh, in the United States. And uh, why? Because they have no hope. They have not uh, peace of Jesus Christ in their heart. And, uh, and there's a lot of alcoholism and drug abuse there on the reservations. And, and uh, we might want to look down on them uh, for that. <coughs> but uh, if you were in that same state, I feel certain we would be the same way. We would be the same way. And I've got a praise report tonight. I've been going to the Iowa Reservation for uh, uh, about five years. The last three years we have uh, tried to have um, a meeting up there. And uh, it weren't until um, uh, this past weekend I finally had some folks to show up. Amen. A uh, year before last, my wife and I went up and, and we advertised and went to the tribal headquarters and invited all the tribal council and knocked on doors and invited folks. And so we went through Sunday through Wednesday and uh, nobody showed up, just me and the wife. So she got some good preaching and I got in some good singing. She's, she's our singer. I had planned to sing for you tonight, but my, but, but my throat is not up to it tonight. But uh, I'm just rejoicing over we had a group to show up uh, there this weekend. On Saturday night, we had 12. On Sunday morning, we had 14. And Sunday night, we had, uh, had 10. Amen. And so I tell you, I just can't hardly keep my feet on the ground. Amen. You know, just uh, rejoicing over that, seeing God's work, God work. And as I preached, I was looking into their faces, and I began to see the Word of God soften their faces. I gave them all Bibles as part of our ministries. We, we uh, supply missionaries with Bibles. And so I had Bibles, and I gave all of them Bibles. And, and so when I got ready to preach, I said, uh, I signed it for them and wrote a little note in there. And I said, turn over in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. And boy, they were all over the place. And so I had to go down each one of them and to show them where Luke 19 was located in the Bible. Now probably everybody in here, even our kids tonight, they know where Luke 19 is located. But on these reservations, uh, we don't have people, we don't have preachers going. And that's a real burden to my soul tonight because folks are not willing to go. And I've been asking God, I said, Lord, why is it that way? Why are people not having the desire to go and to minister to others. Now, I tell you, I, Lord saved me August the 10th, 1980, somewhere around the noonday hour, the Gospel Tabernacle Baptist Church, and I can take you within inches of where it all took place. But ever since that very hour, I've had a desire in my heart to share the Gospel with others. Why? Because of what it means to me. The Savior, and what He done for me, and, and how He pinned my name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Never to be taken away. Boy, don't you want to share that with others? Amen. Now, how could we hoard up that within us? See, the world, everything that the world is seeking after today, you have it. If you're saved today, you have it housed in you. The peace and the joy and the happiness. Sadly, sometimes we don't look that way. But we should be the happiest people. We should have the joy overflowing in our souls from sun up to sunrise. I'm not saying that you're not going to have troubles. You're going to have troubles. And that's, that's in place 
and you'll have troubles until you leave here because this is not our home. We're just passing through. And so we should be out sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, helping missionaries. Uh, part of our ministry is, is we are a support group to missionaries that are already established on the reservations. And, um, and we help them with whatever needs they have. If they financially need money, if they need food, if they need clothes, they need Bibles, they need Bible school material. Uh, I take groups out and do mission projects. We build churches on reservations. And uh, we do repair work. Uh, this past year, uh, mi our summer mission project, I just do one project a year because it's so time consuming. But I should have brought over one of my albums. Uh, I got left them over at uh, Brother Olson's church, but uh, had some pictures there. But you can go on our website and you can see some of those, uh, those pictures. We're, we're still working on that and still trying to get some pictures up. But this past year, our summer mission project was on the Navajo Reservation where we, uh, Brother Raymond Hobbs uh, at uh, Mountain View Baptist Church, they had been meeting for over 15 years and uh, they had been meeting in a, a building that had no electricity, no running water and no indoor plumbing, no bathrooms. And God blessed them with a new piece of property and so they were able to move over to this new piece of property that had access to all the utilities, but they still didn't have a restroom in the church. They had an outhouse down the hill. I got a picture on my phone if you'd like to see it before I leave tonight. For those of you that forgot what an outhouse looks like. <laughs> but we, uh, I had 54 folks to meet us out there, and in eight days we had uh, two restrooms and a classroom built onto this uh, Navajo church. And, uh, and they just, they wept. They cried over having a bathroom. But when's the last time we've cried over indoor plumbing? Yeah, I counted it up. It was 45 years ago Dad built our house. And we had our first indoor plumbing. And I remember how happy I was and how excited I was to be able to take a shower inside. Before that, we heated our water on the, on the stove, a wood stove, and had a big old uh, tin tub and... Uh, and we, we, all of us kids, we washed in that same tub, in that same water, all five of us. Every Saturday, whether we needed it or not. But the tears ran down their faces just to have that. This little Navajo lady, she come walking in and she had on her long flowing Navajo dress and long sleeves and all of her jewelry on. And she looks at it and she says, oh my, she says, <clears throat> Does it work? I said, sure it works. Shh. And tears ran down her face to have indoor plumbing. Now this blessed me because I got pictures I can show you that. On the wall there, there was 19 pictures of missionaries that they supported. Having no indoor plumbing, have no electricity, but yet they had a burden for missions. 19 missionary pictures hanging on the wall in there. Amen. That is the heartbeat of God, is missions. Do you know that the only reason that the church is here today is to evangelize the world? Right. And we're too busy building bigger barns and, and getting things more bigger and fancier than the next church down the road. And we're losing sight of all the lost people that's out there that are dying and going to hell daily around us. And I don't want to be that way. Every morning when my feet hit the ground, I want to cry out to God and say, Lord, thank you for another day. Where do you want me to go today, Lord? Who do you want me to see today? Where is that person at that I can share the gospel with today? I don't have much money, Lord, in my pockets, but it's all yours. If there's somebody out there that needs it, you send me where you want me to and help me to be willing to give to missions. I tell you, I've been saved 35 years, and it's always been, from day one, it's been an expensive endeavor. It's always cost me to serve God. If you serve God the way He wants you to, It'll cost you. Cost you your time. You're here tonight. 
cost you gas to come over here tonight. Maybe some of you had to stop and eat out because you didn't have time to cook before you came. It cost you to serve God. There's a man on the Iowa reservation that I have drove over a thousand miles one way to go up there and pick him up and take him out to the Mexican restaurant and to feed him lunch and sit across the table and cry in the depths of my soul. Say, Lord, help me to be a witness to this man. Save him. Save him for Jesus' sake. I've made several trips that way. And I saw him. He's almost 80 years old. He's 79 years old. And I visited with him, and he was not doing well. I didn't get to spend as much time with him this past weekend as I'd like to have. I sure would love to see him safe. He's one of the uh, traditional natives that hold to some of the traditional ways, and he has a lot of influence on, on the tribe, tribe, other tribal members there, and, and he could influence them in a great way if, they, uh, if, if God was to save him. So you, you pray for him. His name is Pete Thee, F-E-E. Pete Fee, we sure would love to see God save him and that he might be instrumental there working amongst that tribe. And we'd love for you to come out and be with us this summer. Uh, our summer mission project this year will be on the, uh, in Cortez, Colorado. We'll be working with the Southern Ute and the uh, Navajo. We're going to have two weeks, a week of evangelistic knocking on doors and inviting uh, kids to come and, and uh, giving out Bibles and tracts. And, and then the next week we'll have a kids camp. So we need workers to come and help us in the camp. And uh, then those two weeks while all that's going on, we're going to be working on the camp construction, whatever uh, that the missionary needs there. Brother Jason Walters, he's the one that we're going to be there with. And so we sure would love for you to come and, and join with us. Uh, you could stay right there at the camp. $35 for the week. You could bring the kids with you and let them be campers along with the uh, other native kids there. And, uh, and you could stay right there at the camp. $35 for the week, and that's your room and board. Food, you know, all you have to do is bring a sleeping bag with you. But we would love for you to come. And right now we're working with... Uh, <clears throat> With, uh, I think I counted it up a little while back, 49 tribes throughout the United States, Alaska, and Canada. Pray for us. We're trying to uh, uh, get things organized where we can go to Alaska in June. There's a summer camp up there we want to work with. Uh, 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 Bible Baptist Church there in Furbanks. Alaska, they, they bring down, they fly down the kids out of the Arctic and bring them to a summer camp in the summertime. And so we want to go and help them in that camp for a week. And then there's two missionaries that we work with up there, Brother David Youngblood. He's up in the Arctic and fly up there and, and uh, be with him for a week. And then another brother, Kevin Smith, he's between uh, Furbanks and uh, Anchorage and help him. He started a new work there. He was on, on the island of Savonga, which is between Alaska and Russia. There's an island out there that still belongs to the United States. And, and so, uh, and uh, three years ago, we were up there. We went in, flew into Point Hope. It's, uh, we were 500 miles northwest of Fairbanks, and when we flew out of Fairbanks, we left every road behind. There was not a road. And that's the only way to get into those villages. We have over 500 Native American tribes in the nation, over 300 major reservations, and less than 20% of them have the gospel preached to them. And half of them are in Alaska. And oh, how we need missionaries to go to Alaska and to uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ to those dear folks up there. And, uh, and also, well, let's read, a, let's read a scripture. I won't hold you... Uh, much longer. Do I go by this clock, brother, or my clock? Okay. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to make this real quick.
We want to focus just a few minutes on missions tonight. <coughs> We've already said that missions is the heartbeat of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, and I trust you do, turn over to Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10. And thank you again, brother, for allowing us to uh, use the missions quarters and, and, uh, and thank you for allowing us to speak tonight. I, I feel my smallness tonight. Uh, and also, you just, uh, just pray for us. And Romans chapter 10. Let's begin reading in verse number uh, 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, uh, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Boy, ain't you glad of that tonight? Amen. Ain't you glad that He is no respecter of person tonight? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except, uh, except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much, God, for allowing us to be present in the house of the Lord tonight. There's many places we could have been tonight, Lord. We could have been put in a bed of affliction. We could have been locked behind some prison bar somewhere. But worse than all that, Lord, we could have had a, not a desire to come. Oh, God, I'm glad of the day that you saved me from a life of sin. You put a desire in my heart to meet with your people, God, for the purpose of worshiping you. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. I pray now, God, that you'll bless your word. I pray that you open our blinded eyes and help us to see. Open our deaf ears and help us to hear. And give us a heart to receive. Except you open our blinded eyes. Except you open our deaf ears. And except you give us a heart to receive. We'll go away tonight having not seen. And we'll go away having not heard. And we'll go away having not received. But we don't want to tonight. But we want to see all that you'd have us to see. We want to hear all that you'd have us to see to hear, and we want to receive in our hearts all that you would have us to tonight, and we'll praise you for all that you do in Christ's name. Amen. The scripture we want to focus on tonight is, uh, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher. And just like those uh, Iowa tribe that I just came from, there's nobody up there. There's nobody up there preaching God's word uh, to those people. And they, have, they don't have that opportunity that we have tonight. So we need preachers to go and to preach God's word. And I want to liken this just a little bit to our lands. And we can relate to this just a little bit. If we leave our lands unattended, lands that become, those lands become impassable. You know, if, you, if we got to have fields that we cultivate today, and if we turn them loose and fail to cultivate and fail to care for them, eventually they just grow up. They just grow up. And same way with our pastures where our cattle roam and they feed and all. If we don't attend to those pastures and take care of them, they grow up and they become a thorny mess. And, uh, and then, then before long, we, we begin to travel around them, that thorny mess. You see, that's the way the gospel is. When we don't get the gospel out and we don't preach God's word. Now, there are some communities here in Wichita that has grown up just like in all of our cities. There are some communities here that have grown up. You don't drive through those places anymore. You drive around them. And you're thinking about those communities right now. You don't drive through them. Why? The thorns have taken hold. There's nothing in there but sin. 
drug houses, and all kind of sins that's going on in those communities. And so we get where we don't, we don't travel through those communities anymore. We just take a little extra time and drive around them. They become thorny, a thorny mess. We travel around them. And then the land, it becomes unusable. It's not good for anything. It begins to run down. There's parts in this city tonight that's running down. It's decaying. It's decaying under the weight of sin. It's decaying right before our eyes. And it shouldn't be. We should be in those communities cultivating. We should be in those communities sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and weeding out the sin that's in there. How? Through the power of God's Word. The land becomes unusable. The land is without profit. There are people in these communities that we're talking about that are dying and going to hell. While we have our Baptist churches right here in these communities, but yet we're failing to reach out into these unprofitable, these brushy communities, these communities that we have forsaken, and we begin to drive around and we have nothing else to do with them. And so they become unprofitable, and the land, and the land soon will become uninhabitable. There is no life in them. The life of Jesus Christ is not in these communities anymore because we have forsaken them. We have lost sight of our mission and that is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone. I got curious a little while back and and I looked, I remembered the, <clears throat> the story of, of Yellowstone and the fire that took place. It was in 1988, and there are some in here that weren't even born then in 1988. But it was a big fire that took place in Yellowstone. Let me read to you just a few statistics about that fire. The Yellowstone Fire of 1988 together formed the largest wall fire in record history of Yellowstone National Park in the United States, which burned for several months. On September the 8th of 1988, the entire park was closed to all non-emergency personnel for the first time in its history. Only the arrival of cool and moist weather in the late autumn brought the fire to an end. A total of 793,883 acres Mainly 36% of the park was affected by the fire. Thousands of firefighters fought the fire, uh, assisted by dozens of helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft, which were used for, the, uh, for water uh, and fire retardant drops. At the, par at the peak of the effort, over 9,000 firefighters were assigned to the park. Over 4,000 U.S. military personnel were soon brought to assist in the fire suppression efforts. The firefighting cost $120 million. No firefighters died while fighting the Yellowstone Fire, though there were two fire-related deaths outside the park. Before the late 1960s, fire was generally believed to be detrimental for park and forest and management policies were aimed at suppressing fires as quickly as possible. However, as the beneficiary ecological role of the fire became better understood in the decades before 1988, a policy was adopted of allowing natural fires to burn under controlled conditions. Not, uh, not long after the fire ended, plant and tree species quickly reestablished themselves and natural plant regeneration had been highly successful. Media account of mismanagement were often uh, uh, inadequate. 
sometimes wrongfully reporting or implying that most of the park was being destroyed. The most uh, destructive fire were the canopy, uh, canopy crown fires that in many uh, places obliterated entire forest. Crown fires uh, accounted for about 41% of all the area that burned. The recovery from the fires began almost immediately. The plants such as fireweed appearing in a matter of days after the fire had passed, while surrounding national forests did some uh, replanting and even uh, dispersed uh, grass seed by airplane. Uh, the uh, regeneration in Yellowstone was generally so complete that no replanting was ever attempted, though some small plants did not immediately reassume their pre-fire habitats. Most did, and the vast majority of the plants regrew from existing sprouts which survived the heat from the fire. The average depth of the charred soil uh, was only about a half inch so, uh, so few roots were of grass were killed by the fire. This allowed rapid regeneration throughout the ecosystem. Uh, the uh, prominent tree in Yellowstone, the lodgepole pine, fared poorly from the fire, except in areas where the heat and the flames were very mild. The lodgepole pine uh, is often produces pine cones that remain closed and will not disperse seeds unless subjected to fire. Research of the test plots uh, established after the fires indicate, indicated that the best seed dis dispersal occurred in areas which had experienced severe ground fire. And the seed dispersal was lowest in areas which uh, had only minor, minor surface burns. Regions with uh, uh, crown fires sometimes had the highest rates of regeneration of large pole pine. Aspen became more widespread after the fire, occupying areas that had been uh, dominated by other plant life. It had uh, long been uh, believed that aspen regenerated by uh, sprouting from existing roots rather than by seed dispersal. However, aspen sprouts appeared two years after the fire as far away as nine miles from the nearest known aspen tree. Aspen is a preferred grazing food for elk. Contrary to the media report and speculation at the time, the fire killed very few animals. Surveys indicate that only about 345 elk out of the over 40 to 50,000 perished, 36 mule deer, 12 moose, 6 black bears, and 9 bison perished. Of the 21 grizzlies that were radio collared and had some ranges where the fires uh, happened, only one uh, was believed to have been lost. Grizzlies were observed in burned areas more often than in the unburned areas uh, the following year. Approximately 100 dead fish were reported in two streams after the fire retardant was accidentally dropped on them. And what am I saying with that report there? It's going to take the fire of God to go into these communities. It's going to take us going into these communities through missions and, and through the fire of God regenerate. Did you hear that word? It, it, some of those uh, plant life, it only germinated after the fire. It's the fire of God's Word. And what does the fire of God's Word do? It burns away the thorny mess that hinders the passageway into our hearts. It tills the stony ground of our hearts. It inhabits the once impassable places in our hearts, the unusable places in our hearts, 
and the uninhabitable places in our hearts, the fire of God. And we need to get busy and get into these communities and to share the word of God to this lost and dying generation. Deuteronomy 4.33 says, Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire? He speaks through the fire. 1 Kings 18.24 uh, the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. God that answers by fire, he is a God that answers by fire. In 2 Kings uh, one twelve, if, if uh, I be a man of God, let fire fall down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. The fire of God is a consuming fire. In Job 1, 16, the fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. The fire of God is a dividing fire. Jeremiah 5, 14, Behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. And this people would, and he shall devour them. His words are a fire in the mouths of his pe preachers. In Jeremiah 20 and 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his words was in my heart as burning fire shut up in my bones. His word is like fire in our bones. Ezekiel 20, 47. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and it shall devour every grain tree in thee. He is a devourer in fire. Ezekiel 22, 31. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. He is a fire of wrath tonight. Ezekiel 36 and 5, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken. He is a fire of jealousy tonight. Daniel 3, 25, He answered and he said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. He is the fire that protects us from the fire. In Mark 9, 47, uh, It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. He is the fire that fires hell tonight. In 2 Thessalonians 1.8, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, He is the fire of vengeance tonight. In Revelations 2.18, These things saith the Son of God, uh, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire. He has eyes of fire tonight. In Revelations 4 and 5, And there were seven lamps in the uh, lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. He is that lamp of fire tonight. Revelations 14 and 10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall torment with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. He is a tormenting fire tonight. And we need to be busy about the Lord's business Amen. and laboring in the work of the Lord. Why? Because men and women are dying all around us and going to hell. How can we stand idle around and watch this happen? Yes, sir. It's right out our front doors. It's right out our back doors and on either side of us. Men and women tonight and boys and girls, they need us to go to them. They need for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and let them know that there is a better way. The reservations that I go to, the people have no hope and they're dying on every hand. 
I'm trying to reach as many as I can. I'm spending my life, the rest of my life, doing that very thing. And I pray for myself daily, and I say, Lord, just give me strength to keep pressing on. There's some more people down the road that needs to hear the gospel. And God has called upon us to do that, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to this lost and forgotten world. With every head bowed, give you an opportunity just to think, meditate for a minute. Are you doing all that you can do today in the service of the Lord? Are you laboring for Him? Do you have the souls of men on your mind? When you pull up to that McDonald's and that person is standing there at that window, are you passing them a track when you drive through and tell them Jesus loves them? The Lord would have us to do that. He'd have us to be busy about the Father's business in these days. You just ask the Lord what, what He wants you to do. And He'll let you know. Thank you, preacher.